Hello and welcome to HBM's Crypto Corner for Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. Already almost into September. We have quite a few things to talk about, so let's get started. First of all, watch out, Nessie. They may get you on film again. Five new webcams installed at Loch Ness. The Loch Ness Monster may be running out of places to hide as a tourism group has installed a whopping five new webcams overlooking the legendary site with the hopes that viewers at home might catch a glimpse of the famed cryptid. The devices reportedly come courtesy of the organization to visit Inverness Loch Ness, who launched the live streams, which can be seen here. There's a link on Sunday. We are delighted to be able to provide live footage of the beautiful Loch Ness every day of the year, declared the group's CEO, Michael Golding. In keeping with the organization's goal of increasing tourism to the location, webcams are stationed at five different hotels that surround the massive lake. One particularly neat feature of the webcams is that viewers are able to simply press a button to take a snapshot of the screen, which will presumably allow for them to quickly capture any potential Nessie sightings. According to Visit Inverness Log Ness, the five streams will run 365 days a year and provide viewers with the opportunity to see the site through all four seasons. With the addition of the new webcams, there are now six such devices watching over Loch Ness, including the widely popular Nessie on the Net live stream, which has produced a bevy of possible sightings over the years. To that end, the significant increase in the number of Loch Ness live streams may not necessarily be met with joy from dedicated monster hunters as webcam sightings had previously proven to be a particularly controversial topic within the community. To some experts, insisting that they have no evidentiary, evidentiary, evidentiary value. The issue is seemingly so contentious that the official Loch Ness Monster Signings Register has not accepted a single webcam report in 2022 after recognizing the dozens of such cases in, recent, in previous years. Time will tell if new live streams will, will, will provide clearer suspected signs of Nessie, or if they will simply inflame the debate over whether or not such cases count, quote-unquote. So, very interesting. Here's one that I would file under Press X to Doubt. Bigfoot roaming around beach in Britain? A pair of peculiar incidents in the British coastal community have left some wondering if Bigfoot, of all creatures, might be roaming a beach in the area. The rather unique case reportedly began last weekend when an unnamed witness was walking along the sand dunes in North Norfolk when he spotted this thing which he estimated stood 15 feet tall and boasted a brawny body which he likened to Arnold Schwarzenegger. After a brief stare down, the man says the creature bounded off across the dunes into the pine forest. When the witness recounted the sighting to his friends, they just laughed at me and told me I should get some glasses. However, another beachgoer in the area stumbled upon something which may add credence to the man's account. On the following Monday, Clemmy Long was walking her dog along the beach in the Holcomb National Nature Reserve with a push letter to a pair of sizable prints, which can be seen here. There's a link. When I saw them, I couldn't believe it, she marveled. They must be five times the size of a human footprint. Taken together, the two incidents that left some speculate that there could indeed be a Bigfoot lurking in the area, and some local residents say that there are urban legends of the creature residing in the pine forest adjacent to the beach area's beaches. What do you think of the two strange reports? Could Bigfoot really be roaming a beach in Britain, or is Sasquatch simply at the center of a big understand misunderstanding? Let's get a look at these footprints.
hey, I accept, out of the way. Well, are there images of these footprints? Okay, get out of the way. Yes, get out of the way. Get out of the way! You're ticking me off here. I'm trying to do my show here. Okay, these are the alleged footprints. There's only two. Let's see, there's only two of them. There's only two of them. There should be a whole line of them. Especially on a beach. I suspect a hoax. I suspect this, these are a hoax. Now, look, look, see, look at this. The, the toes are straight across, which is wrong. They should be diagonal. Toes are straight across. That's a sure sign of a hoax. No, this is a hoax. I think the guy was BSing, really. The guy who claimed he saw one. Yeah, this is, it's a hoax. I think it's a hoax. Next. Here's something interesting, but it may have a more mundane explanation. Watch, chupacabra-like creature caught in India. मुजफ्फरपुर में एक अनोखे किस्म का जानवर देखा गया जिसकी पहचान होना मुश्किल है और माना जा रहा है कि आज तक इस तरह के जानवर को किसी ने नहीं देखा मुजफ्फरपुर के भगवानपुर चौक के निकट इस like जानवर को देखा गया है बताया जा रहा है कि ये मंगलवार की देर रात एक दुकान में घुस गया था जिसे बुधवार की सुबह दुकान खोलने के बाद देखा गया ऐसे अपरिचित जीव को देखने के लिए दुकान के बाहर लोगों की भीड़ जमा हो गई और इलाके में इसकी चर्चा तेज हो गई स्थानीय लोगों के द्वारा इसकी सूचना वन विभाग को दी गई इस जानवर को पकड़ने के दौरान सभी के पसीने छूट गए हालांकि अभी इस जानवर की पहचान नहीं हो पाई है तो अनुमान ये लगाया जा रहा है की ये कोई जंगली जानवर हो सकता है जो भटक कर तक पहुँचा होगा वही वन विभाग ने जानवर को अपने संरक्षण में ले लिया है और जानवर पूरी तरह से सुरक्षित है I don't know what it is, but it's not a chupacabra. A strange piece of footage out of India shows a mysterious hairless creature that was captured in a home that some have likened the peculiar animal to the legendary chupacabra. According to a local media report, the curious critter was discovered crawling up the wall of a residence in the city of Muzaffarpur Muzaffarpur earlier this week. The presence of the puzzling creature understandably caused concern among the people living in the house. They subsequently fled the home shortly after filming the frightening animal. While the residents of the home were too frightened to go back inside while the creature was there, a swarm of people ventured to the house in the hopes of seeing the odd animal from the footage which had gone viral on social media in India. Eventually, local wildlife officials arrived on the scene and managed to catch the critter, which has sparked something of a debate online as no one is quite sure what the creature could be. Perhaps the most popular theory is that the animal is a civet, possibly stricken with mange. Other suggestions include a similarly sick dog or cat, as more imaginative individuals have speculated the infamous chupacabra. 
With that in mind, what do you think it was capturing most of the world? Well, it could be a civet. It's probably, it's not a chupacabra, I can tell you that. It's not, it's not. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not a chupacabra. Again, I go back to the classic description of the chupacabra, which is the creature with spines on its back, spines going down its back, red eyes, short, clawed, That, that's the Chupacabra. This is probably a civet. So again, next! We spoke of the Loch Ness Monster earlier. Here is something else about, about Nessie. The surface of something. 47 years ago, a private meeting in the USA was held by Robert Ryan to the Academy of Applied, of Applied Science to which author Nicholas Witchell was invited to view the best of the underwater pictures taken at Loch Ness. On June 19, 1975, Penguin Books subsequently rushed a new paperback version of Witchell's The Loch Ness Story to tell of the photographs which now place the Loch Ness Monster under the discipline of zoology and not cryptozoology. The final chapter tells us that the order of notable slides was an upwards view of the boat from which the camera rig was suspended, the body and long neck, the gargoyle head, and one final slide. The final good picture showed the underbelly of the animal as it passed immediately above the camera, a cylindrical object stretched across the whole frame. The most noticeable feature of this was the covering of what, evidently, what were evidently parasites hanging off the belly. As we went through the whole sequence of pictures again, Bob described the reaction of a group of experts from the Smithsonian Institute who had flown over from Washington the previous day to see the pictures. Headed by G Professor George Zug, the head of the Reptiles and Amphibians Department, they had been early amazed at what they had seen. They had, he, he said, noticed details which only the trained zoological eye could, would see. For instance, on the underbelly picture, they had been particularly interested by the parasites, and there had been speculation that the dark area towards the left end could be the anal's, could be the creature's anal fold. This is the third in a series of articles on the 1975 underwater photographs taken by Robert Rines, the Academy of Applied Science. You can get the background on these famous pictures from the previous two articles here and here. Actually, I had not intended to write any third article until a fellow Nessie researcher got in touch with me. He pointed me to an archive of photographs maintained by MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which includes photos taken by the technical people from MIT involved in the 1975 search, namely Martin Klein on sonar and Harold Edgerton on optics. Most are pictures of people directly and indirectly involved in the hunt. Places around the lock, the lock Martin Klein's sonar work, and Harold Edgerton's underwater camera work. It is a fascinating collection of a time when people thought the monster was almost within their grasp. The Edgerton collection homes in on the underwater camera work done in Urquhart Bay under the auspices of the Academy of Applied Science. Most of the photos revolve around the ones we know about, the gargoyle head, the long neck body, and so on. I looked through some of the hundreds of pictures in the archive, and then my fellow researcher pointed me to the image at the top of this article, which would be a candidate for that final good picture mentioned by Witchell above. The fascinating thing is that I have never seen this photograph before in any book, magazine, discussion, webpage, or TV documentary in the decades I've been following this mystery. It was perhaps mentioned in words in some publications, but I would have assumed it was something else. The classification on the of the picture on the MIT website is as follows. Water surface, Loch Ness, Scotland. No date, UK, no date. Major collection, science and technology. Name collection, Harold E. Edgerton collection. Object type, color slide. Maker, Edgerton, Harold Eugene. Place made in the United States. Materials, 35 millimeter film, plastic. Site location, Scotland, UK. Measurements two, two, two by two. Service on water at Loch Ness in Scotland, UK. Duplicate, CC. 
I will now look at the pros of con pros and cons of whether this is a photograph from the 1975 exhibition if it is of the locked bed. The classification is uncertain as to when and where this was taken and suggests it is the surface of the waters of Loch Ness. It appears as if the curator has no backstory to it from anyone involved in 1975. Having looked at untold number of pictures of the watery surface of Loch Ness, I am certain the features on this surface have little to do with water and more to do with the solid surface. Let me now explain why I think this photograph can be the one described by Nicholas Witchell. First, he says the object is above, cam above the camera. To give some context here, the setup of the 1975 camera rigs is shown below. <coughs> The camera in question was the old 1972 strobe light -like camera rig here suspended at a depth of 40 feet. It had been reconfigured to put the camera five feet below the surface and tilted upwards to avoid backscattered light. Nicholas described the surface as stretching across the whole frame as this image does. He describes it as cylindrical and this can be argued for the bottom of the feature where we see what looks like a foreshortening Perspective of surface features as they recede to shallow, consistent shadow consistent with a cylinder. He also describes the surface as above the camera. Since the camera is pointing upwards, one may take this as a given. But if, for example, only the top of the surface was visible and occupied the lower part of the picture, one could say it was in front of the camera rather than above it. And then we have the speculative mention of parasites. In an angle film to the left, the annotated picture below explains how these descriptions would line up well with the image. So we have what appears to be from parasite and anal foam. So this is supposed to be in the body of Nessie. Of course, the matter of anal folds and parasites is secondary as to what we are actually looking at in its entirety, and so much speculations are set aside. Thus, if we assume that this is the image that Nicholas Mitchell was talking about, it leads us now to speculate on what is in the picture. Back in 1975, the AAS team was sure that the mid-camera, mid-water mid camera rig never went near the lock bed, so anything photographed was also in mid-water. However, it is now accepted that the boat from which the rig was suspended was prone to be to drifting under the lock winds and could reach shallower waters and drag the rig along, to the lock, along the lock bed whilst taking pictures at about one minute intervals. What is uncertain is how much this coincided with the photos taken on the June, night of June 19th to the 20th. For comparison, here are some shots of the lock bed taken during that time. The first was a calibration shot and the second was taken on the 19th of June. We shall return to this shot later. The third shows the effect of self-disturbance, which was especially evident in the famous gargoyle shot. It is evident that there are differences between the surface of the image in question and the lock bed. The silt that accumulates on the lock bed basically gives it a smooth appearance, which is punctuated by the appearance of rocks, branches, rubbish, and so on. The rough textured surfaces gives no indication that any silt is present there or indeed objects such as rocks and branches. In fact, when I first saw the image, I thought it looked more like the surface of the moon from a satellite. I would also suggest the presence of the gouges on the, on the image to the top left and top right dictate against the silt and surface, as the volatility of disturbed silt will not leave such sharp features. I say this in anticipation of suggestions that the gouges are produced by the camera rig dragging along the surface. The other point to make is that if this was the bed of the lock, it's almost as if there were, it was a plain, planned view of the surface, as the camera rig was parallel to the bed hovering a few feet above it. It does not seem a likely scenario. If the camera was going to be parallel to the surface, it would be face down and probably in a cloud of silt. However, the clarity and quality of the image under scrutiny is clearly superior to the other images, which begs the question as to what circumstances allowed this to happen. Why is the image so, so sharp and detailed compared to the lock bed and the images? It could be because it is in a silt-free region such as mid-water, 
thus aiding clarity or maybe a lot closer and thus reducing any attenuation of detail by the volume of water between camera and object. Or perhaps it is an image of the camera pointing up at the disturbed waters of the locked surface. The image below is of the locked surface see, during those days when the camera was tilted up. <coughs> Clearly this lacks the clarity, detail, and texture of the image and thus we should discount the surface of the lock as an explanation. One, explain the one remaining explanation related to the lock bed it's the possibility that the camera rig did not go, did not hit the bed, but had rotated in the water to face the locked wall. This is a theoretical possibility, though the sides are not vertical, but slope to varying degrees. I cannot find an image which shows the sides of the lock underwater in close detail, but I doubt the sides will look like this image, still, since I still expect silt to lie inside cliffs and indeed expect gravity to ensure surface features <coughs> are more vertical in appearance. Excuse me. Nevertheless, I will keep this view on hold until suitable sidewall images turn up. But there are arguments against the image. One is that it has been accepted that the image described by Witchell was the locked bed image previously shown, which we show again below. This was actually printed in the MIT Journal. Technology Review in March 1976 which discussed the 1975 images and was interpreted by the AAS as a cylindrical object 10 feet away, but they made no mention of parasites or anal fold. Now it could be that image, though I see nothing to the left to suggest an anal fold, and the proposed creature would be swimming upside down, though this is not unheard of in the marine world. Then again, what should an anal fold look like? What did George Zug have in mind? Nevertheless, I can see features in both photographs which line up with Mitchell's description. Obviously, the most expedient solution is to ask the man himself. Now, if this was the rough skin of Loch Ness Monster, then it would be an astounding win for Ryan to the Academy. But some questions have to be answered before we go that far through <clears throat> the rough texture of the surface evokes various thoughts as it did with those vaudists back in 1975. My curiosity was aimed at an almost star-shaped scar or gouge to the top right. Is that an animal-like feature or something else? Also, the superior clarity of the image may be so good as to mitigate against it being taken by the same camera. But no sooner was this picture possibly mentioned by Witchell and perhaps Meredith in his book Search at Loch Ness that it disappears from view, if indeed it ever appeared in the public space. And therein lies the biggest problem concerning this image. If it was believed to be the underbelly of the creature, why was it not published? Robert Ryan's also not had to have passed up on such an opportunity. The fact that the curator puts a question mark against it being from Loch Ness and has no date for it should make us pause before going further. <clears throat> Indeed, this article is probably more an appeal for further information to corroborate this picture and claiming it is of the monster. I can confidently say it is not a photograph of the lock bed of 1975, it is something else. It may have been taken during the expedition, or maybe another year, or another spot at Loch Ness, or maybe not at Loch Ness at all. The bottom line is that more information is needed to determine the provenance of this photograph. If that comes, a follow-up article may be required. So, indeed, we seem to have a genuine mystery here. What could be in that photograph? Who knows? Is it Nessie? Good question. Newly released <coughs> Sasquatch data shows more Wyoming people are Bigfoot believers. In November 1997, a man and his brother were cutting firewood in the road from Cody to Yellowstone's East Gate. They were startled by a strange sight in the distance. Looking through binoculars, this was their report. It was definitely upright, walking on two legs. Or there is no way to say at this distance. The specimen appeared to be between 6 and 10 feet in height. More striking, however, was its mass. The creature, covered in dark hair, almost seemed fat. Maybe obese. This was no bear. I saw it walk for a good hundred yards and never came down on all fours. Bigfoot. Over the last 50 years or so, there have been 28 reported sightings in Wyoming of a tall, muscular creature 
covered in dark hair with long arms leaving behind huge footprints. More than 10,000 people in the continental U.S. have claimed to have had encounters with over the decades with creatures known as Sasquatch. Those claiming to have seen or interacted with legendary beasts are often met with disbelief and suspicion. But their disbelief is slowly dissipating. A survey in July by Civic Science found that more Americans believe in Bigfoot than they have in the past. Over the past two years, the number of adults in the United States who believe that Bigfoot is a real living creature has gone up from 11% to those polled, of those polled in 2020 to 13%. But for many Wyomingites, Bigfoot's existence is old news, as sightings have been reported throughout the region for decades. Bigfoot in Wyoming. The Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, founded in 1995, documents sightings of the mythical beasts in North America. According to the BFRO database, the most frequent sightings in Wyoming have been in Park County. Nine instances have been reported over the years there, compared to other counties. Lincoln has had four sightings. Teton and Carbon counties have three each listed in the database. Uinta has two. Several other Wyoming counties have each had one reported sighting of the elusive Sasquatch. Brook, Fremont, Johnson, Sheridan, Sublet, Sweetwater, and Washakie. I do know that there are several sightings that occurred in Wyoming, said noted Wyoming outdoorsman Paul Ulrich. Ulrich. Everywhere from up near Jackson to the Wind River Range where I grew up outside of Cody. And all those skeptics may balk. Some of the reports have come from highly credible sources. Trained geologists. In 1978, two trained geologists were on their way to Yellowstone National Park, driving west on Highway 14 at approximately 1.45 a.m. when they were startled by a large, dark, shaggy figure coming up out of the ditch. As we approached the figure at a speed of about 45 miles per hour, it looked first at the vehicle. We noticed the yellow reflection from its eyes and it seen in a dog's eye and the light catches it at night, then deliberately turns his head away from the lights. That motion was non human or bear like, and that the shoulders, chest, and head moved simultaneously as it caught sight of our vehicle and then turned its face away from the headlights. The geologists agree that the creature was between seven, six and seven foot tall, weighed between 600 to 800 pounds, and was de most definitely not a bear. Neither was under the influence of alcohol or medication, and neither professed to believe in ghosts or other unexplained phenomena. Mount Washburn. The most recent listing on the BFRO page for Park County was the account of a family of four touring Yellowstone National Park in July of 2002. I was in my parents' car on the northwest side of Mount Washburn in Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming, when my mom, dad, brother, and I saw a humanoid figure too tall to be human, walking up right along a ridge about 300 yards off. It looked hairy, and between 8 and 10 feet tall. It was around noon, and it was partly cloudy, and my family was scanning the ridge for bighorn sheep when we saw it. Most famous. The most famous of all the Wyoming Bigfoot stories, however, was the account of Wyoming game and fish biologist John Mianzinski who spent almost two hours on a bright, sunlit, moonlit night in the Wind River, River Range in 1972 in a standoff with what could only be described as Bigfoot. Around midnight, I heard something outside. It was kind of a rumbling sound, like somebody snoring. Mine Ziski told listeners of the Sasquatch Tracks podcast this past December. And I saw a shadow come by. Mine Ziski said the nearly full moon was bright, and the silhouette cast by the moonlight made him think a bear was nosing around a begging priest staying on his tent. So he smacked the beast through the canvas wall. I took my right hand and just whacked it with the back of my hand. He yelled real loud right then, and that scared it, he said. But the creature didn't move too far away, actually returning to the side wall of his tent two more times. When Mine Ziski reached out a third time, he realized this was no bear. This time when it came back, the silhouette was different. It was standing upright, he said. I hit it with my hand, and the instant I did that, I saw the silhouette of an arm come down on top of my tent, which was about six foot four high. The arm was long, covered with hair, and there was a humanoid hand at the end of that arm. The silhouette of the hand at the top of my tent, and I say that rather than a bear paw, because digits point straight ahead on a bear paw, and this had obvious fingers. 
four fingers and a thumb that was opposed. The beast pushed down hard on the top of Mainzinski's tent, collapsing it on top of him. Mainzinski said that must have startled the creature, which he still, in his confusion, thought must be some sort of bear. Mainzinski clambered out of his collapsed tent and sat near the fire, holding his firearm, knowing the beast was still nearby. I started dozing off, he said, and I woke up to the sound of something hitting the ground. Several more sounds followed, and Mainzinski realized that something was throwing pine cones. A pine cone seemed to fall out of the tree and landed next to the fire, he said. And another pine cone, and then another pine cone, and I realized there was no wind blowing. These cones were not falling out of the tree. They were being lobbed at me behind this little pine tree, and that went off for about 40, 45 minutes. Well, that was the extent of that experience, said Mindinsky. It threw cut pine cones for 45 minutes and then it left. I all kinds of problems. Come on, move, mouse. Local agencies weigh in. When he reported the incident to the district ranger for the Shoshone National Forest upon his return, Mainzinski was told the team was not alone. The Forest Service had received numerous reports that summer of 1972 of strange sightings and occurrences in that section of the forest similar to his experience. In recent years, though, wildlife agencies like Wyoming Game and Fish are unaware of any sightings of hairy humanoid giants. I've never heard of such things in Corey Class, Wildlife Supervisor, for the Cody Game and Fish Office. But that being said, I don't know. I can only answer based on my time and experience. But we don't know. Although there is yet to be scientific proof that the Bigfoot creatures exist, Ulrich pointed out that there is much yet to be discovered in our world. Think about what we are absolutely convinced we knew 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 10 years ago, to what we know now, Ulrich said. Imagine what we can find or discover or know in 10 to 30 to 50 years from now. Unusual happenings, strange sightings, and mysteries will continue to keep us guessing, said Ulrich. When I was younger, I was convinced of my, when my family was camping up Frank's Fork outside of Mititsi, that a juvenile Sasquatch had wandered into camp, he recalled. <clears throat> the smell was right. The behavior was certainly consistent with what little we know about Bigfoot. Unfortunately, it was just my little sister who went and showered for a few days. And the legend continues. <laughs> well, little sisters, when they don't shower, they do tend to, yeah, get a little bit ripe. Oh, heck, that's anybody. Finally, watch Tasmanian tiger spotted in Australian National Park. Let's take a look at the footage. Hmm, interesting. A woman visiting a national park in Australia captured footage of a curious creature that some suspect could be a Tasmanian tiger. Though not everyone is convinced that the odd animal is a legendary phallus scene. The intriguing sighting reportedly occurred earlier this month when Jessie Mild and her family were visiting Bel Air National Park in South Australia. Their trip took a wondrous turn when, she recalls, we saw this thing starting to move across the road. Initially suspecting that the oddity was a weird looking kangaroo, Mild then came to believe it was a really scag scraggy looking dog, before ultimately contending that she had no idea what the creature could have been. Mild's sister, who accompanied her on the trip, is certain that the family encountered the long, long lost, I should say long lost, not long long, Tasmanian tiger, which was declared extinct decades ago, yet that determination has its doubters as there have been multiple alleged sightings of the animal over the year. 
That's the closest thing to make a compare to the bewildered witness said. Knowing that the creature had a really weird gait to it, a sort of lopping almost movement. He also dismissed the possibility that the animal could have been a fox, observing that the tail was completely different. Its back was really sloped down, and its head was a completely different shape. Fortunately, Miles managed to film some of their sighting using her cell phone, and the video, which can be seen above, may allow for the animal to be identified. Though those hoping that it was a Tasmanian tiger will undoubtedly have their hopes dashed by the suggested solution. Wildlife biologist Nick Moody, who was frequently enlisted by the media to assess possible thylacine footage, argued that the creature has all the hallmarks of a fox with mange. He also noted that this peculiar way of walking was more akin to a small canid type creature rather than a marsupial like a Tasmanian tiger. While this particular sighting may not have turned out to be that of a Tasmanian tiger, hope remains that the creature will still be somewhere out there waiting to be found. So, we have a bit of footage, which is either a Tasmanian tiger or a fox with mange. Hmm. Interesting. And that's good there for this week, a kind of a special long HBO Crypto Corner for this week. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, you guys are the heart of the show, and I always say that, but I always mean it, and I'll continue to do this as long as you guys want me to. And by the way, we're going back to weekly now. We're going back to weekly starting next week. So until then, y'all be good or be good at this HBO Crypto Corner.